Welcome to episode 100 of I Don't Have a Band. Yes, we've reached episode 100. I actually have almost 200 videos here on the channel, but this series, I Don't Have a Band, is devoted to the home studio enthusiasts with all sorts of videos to hopefully help make your home studio life better. So I decided to celebrate by going back to my roots. I'm bringing out a brand new DIY acoustic panel design that I want to share with you. And my good friends at DistroKid are celebrating with me. If you're trying to get your music out to the hottest streaming services, well, DistroKid's got you covered. And I've got a discount for you. I'll give you some more information about that a little bit later. Well, we're going to build DIY acoustic panels 3.0. Are you ready to join me? I'm Dan, the self-proclaimed lonely rocker. Let's go. DIY is all about experimentation. Now, as you know, there are a ton of DIY videos out there with self-proclaimed gurus showing you the best way to make something. But I decided to treat this build video a little bit differently. Now, I had this idea for this panel. It was born out of this DIY vocal booth here with these acoustic tiles that I put on the wall. If you want more information about this, I did a whole video on this build. I'll put a link in the description. But I really like the look of these tiles and I was wondering if I could use them in an acoustic panel. Now, the thing about acoustic panel builds, the part that I like the least is wrapping the fabric on the outside. And when you're making a ton of panels, it gets a little laborious after a while. So I came up with this idea, which became a prototype. Now, instead of refining the prototype and making a video about the perfect version of this panel, I decided to take you through the journey of making the first one and even talking about some of the problems that I encountered along the way. The idea is that you can take this concept and run with it and make it your own. That's really the spirit of DIY. By the way, don't forget that this video is sponsored by DistroKid. If you're looking to get your music on the hottest streaming services out there, I'm talking Spotify, I'm talking iTunes, I'm talking others that you haven't even heard about. All you need to do is upload your tracks to their service and they take care of everything. It's really inexpensive to sign up and you know what? It's even cheaper because you're watching this video. I got a link in the description. Make sure to check that out. All right, let's get back to the video. So there's three main components to this build. There's the tile assembly for the front, there's the main frame, and there's the insulation inside. Actually, this frame is a, an MDF shelf that I had cut into strips. I had some people asking me on some of my other videos if they could use MDF instead of wood, so I thought I'd give it a try, and this came pre-finished, so it looked like a good idea. We'll discuss that. Also, I have a, a different way to install the insulation. I've gone back to using Rockwell Safe and Sound. I used Comfortboard in some of my last builds, which is a more rigid insulation, but I've gone back to the, the Safe and Sound, but I have a new way or a different way to install it, so make sure to stay tuned to see what that's all about. Now, in terms of the size, uh, I typically build a two foot by four foot panel as I generally put around my mixing desk, but I'm actually making this panel for my lounge area. Now, because this is built on the concept of these tiles, the dimensions of this panel really are determined by the number of tiles that I want to use. In this case, I've gone with a two by three configuration. You can go two by two, two by four, four by four, whatever you choose to do, you're going to base your measurements on the tile configuration. And I'm going to show you how that all goes together. So I'm going to start with this acoustic tile assembly here on the front. There's actually an inner frame holding it all together. I'm going to show you what that's all about. All right, let's get started. The inner frame was designed to mount the acoustic tiles independently of the outer box. I wanted them mounted inside the main frame, flush with the front of the panel. The tiles are glued onto the frame, and then the whole assembly is fastened inside the outer box. For tools, I used a tape measure, hacksaw, hammer, hot glue gun, a pencil, and a screwdriver. For materials, I used some trim I found at the hardware store. This had enough of a ledge to glue the tiles onto. For the centerpiece, I used a wider, flat trim. To assemble it, I used L brackets, short wood screws, finishing nails, and a glue called No More Nails. You could also use carpenter's glue. And then of course, the acoustic tiles. You could substitute these acoustic tiles with any type of foam tiles. The size and thickness of these tiles will impact your design and the amount of space you have for your insulation. Just base your measurements on whatever tiles you choose. By the way, this video assumes you've got some basic carpentry skills. This is not a carpentry tutorial, so I'm going to make some assumptions that you know what you're doing. If you've never done this before, I definitely recommend that you practice before you attempt to make the build. If this is your first acoustic panel, I highly recommend you check out my cheap and awesome acoustic panels video. That's a lot simpler than this particular panel. Definitely worth checking out. Hey, watch them both and figure out the type of panel that you want to make. All right, let's get back into it. I measured the length of three panels and then two panels to determine the height and width of the inner frame. For the long sides, I measured and marked the material. 
I use the straight edge to mark the cut line and then cut the first piece with a hacksaw. I then use the piece I just cut as a template to measure and mark the second piece to ensure I would have two identical lengths. For the top pieces, you have to account for the thickness of the wood of the side pieces. This is my desired length, but I subtracted the width of the two side pieces to determine where I needed to cut to reach my desired final width. And then I made the cut. Again, I use the first piece as a template for the second piece. To assemble the frame, I decided to use L brackets, but you could also use finishing nails and glue. It just needs to be strong enough to manipulate and to glue on the tiles. It will be anchored into the main frame of the panel later. I position the L brackets, mark the location of each hole, and use short wood screws to assemble everything together. While I'm assembling the frame, I wanted to share some of the cool marketing features that are completely free to DistroKid members. The Spotlight feature lets you choose a song to get featured on a DistroKid playlist on Spotify. Spotify Canvas lets you make your tracks pop with animated album art. Your sync lyrics get submitted to search engines. You can create promo cards and mini videos to promote your releases on social media. And the Upstream feature lets you privately share your music, streaming stats, and contact info with major labels. These powerful marketing tools are all free to DistroKid members. Check the link in the description. The end result being a simple frame like this. Next, I measured and marked the trim piece for the center and cut the wood with my hacksaw. I marked the center point along the top and bottom of the frame, as well as the center of the middle trim piece. This helped me to line up the piece properly in the middle of the frame. I used a few dabs of glue at the bond point and then moved the trim piece into place. And then I did the same thing on the opposite side. To secure it, I tapped in two finishing nails on each end. The frame was now ready for the acoustic tiles. I placed the tiles onto the frame and ensured they were all lined up correctly. I then removed the first tile and used a hot glue gun and ran a bead of glue around the section of the frame where it would be fastened. I then carefully placed the tile and applied a little pressure until the tile was securely in place. I was then able to remove the remaining tiles freely and install them using the first one as a guide, following the same procedure for each tile. Once all of the tiles were in place, it looked like this. Now let's tackle the outer frame. So here is where I encountered my first challenge. My original plan was to go with miter cuts. Now, for those of you not familiar with a miter cut, that's where you cut your wood at a 45 degree angle, both pieces, and join them to make perfect corners. So I'm gonna put a little glue here, use the L brackets, and everything was supposed to be perfect, but it wasn't holding that well. And the truth is, to make really good miter cuts, you need a table saw. Uh, I'm using a circular saw, I can you know, alter the blade to a 45 degree angle, uh, but they're not perfect, so the corners just didn't look very good. And I, I don't want to complicate this build, I and mean, most of you are probably not going to have a table saw, so I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible, and it just, it just wasn't working. So I just cut straight cuts, did the old fashioned butt joint, I believe they call it, and uh, again, the idea is just to try and keep it simple. All right, let's get back to the build. The tools I used for this part of the build were a circular saw, tape measure, straight edge, pencil, drill, paintbrush, and a screwdriver. 
and my adjustable workbench really helped for this part of the job since I didn't have anyone to help me. For materials, I used the MDF, carpenter's glue, wood screws, and some semi-white gloss trim paint. The finished inner frame determines the inside measurement of the outer frame, so I double checked the length and width and took into account the thickness of the MDF stock. This determined the dimensions of the material I needed. Always be mindful which pieces are fastened on the inside and remember to calculate that before cutting your stock. I also used the inner frame itself to check my mark before I cut. As before, once I had the first piece cut, I used it as a template for the second piece. I secured a side piece on my workbench, ran a bit of glue, and placed a cross piece on top. Holding the stock in place, I drilled two pilot holes and then used a larger drill bit to carve out some material to accommodate the head of the screw. There are countersink bits, but I don't have any. If you do it this way, be careful not to drill all the way through. Then I screwed in two screws on each corner. I followed the same process for the other side. The other end will be screwed in after the inner frame is installed. I laid the assembly on the floor face up, including the bottom piece that will be installed later, and painted the exposed MDF on the face of the panel and on the corners. So I wanted to touch on the MDF. This is something I thought I'd try because a lot of people ask me in some of my other videos if they could use MDF instead of real wood. And also, I like this white finish and I thought I'd save some time not having to sand and paint the wood. I thought I'd skip a couple of steps and get it done quicker. But after giving it a try, I have to be honest, I don't like working with MDF. Number one, it's messy. This fine dust you get from it when you cut it, I don't know what I'm breathing in. Also, even though I drilled pilot holes, I found when I was drilling in the screws, uh, the material was cracking. Yeah, I could have drilled bigger pilot holes, but you know, in wood, I don't have to do that. You know, if I get a little split here and there, I can fill it, I can sand it, I can shape it. I can't do that with MDF. I just find wood a lot more forgiving and a lot more satisfying, just lets me be more creative. I felt kind of locked in. So I'll, I'll use the remaining pieces that I have for the other panels that I want to build, but uh, I think I'm going back to real wood. The next step was to install the front tile assembly into the frame. Mine was quite snug. I used a hammer to gently position it into place and check that it was even all around. Once I was satisfied that everything was in place, I installed the last piece of the outer frame using a similar process as the other pieces. With the outer frame complete, I then drilled pilot holes in the inner frame and secured it to the outer frame with short wood screws. Make sure your screws are long enough to grip into the frame, but short enough so they don't poke through the outside. I screwed them in manually with a screwdriver just to ensure I wouldn't poke a hole all the way through. I put screws near each corner and in the middle to ensure the inner frame was evenly secured. And now the panel was ready for the inner absorption material. So for the insulation, I've actually gone back to using Rockwell Safe and Sound. In my last couple build videos, I moved over to Rockwell Comfort Board 80, which is a more rigid product. But in consulting with a professional, he actually likes the, the more loose fiber uh, insulation. He feels it's more of an efficient absorber. But one of the problems with safe and sound or other sort of flimsy insulation is once you've installed it as a full sheet in your panel and you hang that thing on the wall, uh, those of you who have built panels will probably notice sometimes they can sag. So I'm going to use safe and sound, but I've got a different way to install it that will ensure that they don't sag and actually will improve the absorption of the panels. All right, let's check it out. The last step was filling the frame with insulation. The tools needed for this stage are a utility knife, scissors, and a staple gun. For materials, I use Rockwell Safe and Sound 24 inch and a thin white fabric. This is the material you often see me using as the backing material for my panels. 
It's thin and very breathable. And of course, some staples. I draped the fabric over the box and trimmed it so it fit inside with enough material to staple around the box. I then stapled the fabric around the perimeter close to the inner frame. This creates an additional protective layer to keep the insulation fibers inside. I measured the depth inside the frame. Mine was about three and a half inches. I measured the insulation and used a straight edge and sharp utility knife to cut the insulation into three and a half inch strips. Make sure to wear gloves and a mask when working with insulation. Once I established my cut line, I pressed firmly down on the straight edge and cut through the insulation with the utility knife. It sometimes required a few passes to cut through. Just make sure the strips don't fall apart. A nice sharp knife is key here. Just carefully repeat this process with each strip. It doesn't have to be surgically accurate, but I try to maintain as much consistency as possible. While cutting the insulation, I'll share some other features on DistroKit. Don't forget to check out the link in the description to get your discount on an annual DistroKid membership. Easily get your music on all of the popular streaming platforms like Spotify, iTunes, Apple Music, YouTube Music, Amazon, even TikTok and Instagram, and so much more. Annual memberships start as little as 20 bucks a year, and you get an additional 7% off just by clicking the link in the description. I repeated this process until I had enough strips to fill the frame. Once I had enough material cut, I stacked the strips inside the frame of the panel. I squeezed in the last couple of rows to make sure the insulation was packed in securely. And don't be afraid to fill the box completely with insulation. I'll explain why later. And lastly, I covered the back of the panel with the same backing fabric I used inside. I lined up two sides of the frame with the edge of the fabric and stapled those in place. Then, while stretching the fabric slightly, I stapled in the other two sides with an even row of staples. Once I finished stapling the fabric around the perimeter of the panel, I trimmed the remaining two sides. So why did I fill up the panel with insulation? Well, it's something I wanted to try because generally with my absorbers, I, I leave a bit of an air gap in the back and I build it off the wall a little bit and that's standard practice. But if you want that panel to absorb some frequencies a little bit down lower, like slide down the scale just a little bit, fill up the box with insulation and put it right up against the wall. It'll be more effective in absorbing some frequencies a little bit down lower in the scale. It's not gonna go all the way down necessarily, but it will be more effective, you know, a little bit further down low. It really comes down to what you're trying to do in your studio. Not every absorber is gonna have the same job or gonna tackle the same issue. Now, if you're not taking readings, it is a bit of a crapshoot, but if you do want your panel to absorb a little bit further down low, just fill it right up and stick it up against the wall. And the very last step was installing some mounting hardware. I'm actually gonna hang it by the edge of the panel itself, but I installed a picture hanger with a sawtooth edge so the panel won't slide when hanging on the wall. I measured and marked the center of the frame and tapped in the two screws that came with the picture mount. If you use similar hardware to mount your panel, make sure the teeth of the hanger hang over the edge of the frame slightly so they actually lean on the screw when hanging on the wall. Well, the finished panel is now hanging on the wall. It was really simple to install. One hole in the wall, I put a drywall plug, one screw, and I just hung it like a picture frame. It was simple as that. So final thoughts on this panel. Well, I love the look of it. I definitely gonna push forward with this idea and refine the panel a little bit. As I've already said, uh, the MDF, uh, yeah, I was hoping it would be a bit easier, uh, but ultimately it wasn't. I'm not happy with the corners. They're not perfect, little uh, you know, edges sticking up a little bit. If it was wood, I would have given it a good sand. I can paint it, it would have looked perfect. So unfortunately I gotta live with this one. You know what, I'll try again. I've got a little bit of material left. Maybe I could do better next time. We'll see, but uh, I think I'd recommend going with wood if you wanna make this panel look super professional. Uh, the other thing that I screwed up a little bit was the insulation. Uh, it's a little too thick front to back. Now my panel is about three and three quarter inches thick. I had to take into account the assembly for the, uh, the front 
tiles and uh, my insulation is sort of sticking up on the back a little bit so the frames are not flush up against the wall, which is what I wanted. So I think I'm gonna go back and perform a little surgery just to smooth that out. So just be mindful, uh, measure that properly when you're putting your insulation strips in there. Just keep it flush with the, uh, the thickness of that panel. And then you put your backing fabric on and it should sit flush up against the wall. But that's really it, you know, this was version one of this panel. I will refine it and hopefully I'll get it right the next time. If you do try this design, uh, let me know in the comments. And I want to thank DistroKid for celebrating my 100th episode with me. You guys rock. Don't forget to check out the offer. That link is in the description. So you've got a home studio and you want to learn some cool stuff? Well, I got a couple more videos right here for you to check out. If you want to support this channel, I am on Patreon. I got affiliate links. All that information is in the description below. And remember, the most important thing is you don't need a band to rock and roll. You can achieve a lot of great things on your own. And I hope I'm going to see you again in another video.